Good morning. How good it is to be together in a spirit of worship on this Sunday morning, this Palm Sunday morning. Our Lenten journey has brought us to this moment and how good it is to join Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem. As always, wonderful to have each and every one of you here worshiping with us. I want to extend a special welcome to those who might be visiting with us, uh, especially those who are here for the first time. If if this is your first time worshiping with us here at St. John's, or if you've been here before but haven't had a chance to do this, take a moment to fill out a card. There should be some in front of you in the pew rack. Uh, Looks like this. If you can take a moment to just fill that out, you can leave it on your pew. You can put it in the offering plate when it comes around. You can put it in a basket to the right of the door um, to the narthex. Just a little... uh, some questions to uh, get to know you so that we can learn more about you, so that you can learn more about us, and so that we can thank you for being with us this morning. Whether visitor or not, or regular, no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey, it is our deep desire to meet you where you are, and most importantly, to share God's love with you. So welcome. I do have a few announcements as we enter into Holy Week and celebrate Easter together next Sunday. Um, This is an important one to keep in mind. Our Lenten uh, insert has gotten smaller as the weeks have passed, but some important information here about things happening this afternoon and then all the way through Holy Week and into Easter. So please um, refresh your memories with that purple insert. In your bulletin, there are some other announcements, some other things happening. I just want to draw your attention to a few of them. Um, Our artist series happening this afternoon at 4 p.m. Please join for that. The chancel is already filled with some musical instruments that will accompany the choir, um, and I know that it will be fantastic. So please take time this afternoon to come and join for that as we sort of get ourselves ready to enter into Holy Week. Information in here about helping to provide some treats for Easter morning at the park. Always nice to end that morning outside, uh, especially in this weather with a nice hot cup of coffee and a goodie, so please um, pay attention to that. There's some information in here about lily donations, about a prayer vigil that's happening. The signups for that prayer vigil are in the elevator lobby. You can't miss it. It's right in front of you when you walk out. And then also some information on the back of your bulletins about a new member gathering happening on April 14th, as well as some personnel information as well. So lots of things to pay attention to. But I do hope that you can place all of that to another part of your brain. It'll be there when you're done worshiping this morning, so you can refer back to it. But it is important that we do take a moment to breathe, to inhale to breathe in God's spirit that fills this place and fills each one of us as we worship. Take a moment to exhale and to set aside all the busyness of this season, this day, this week, so that we can be fully present in this time and in this place as together we enter into Holy Week and as we join our hearts and our minds to worship this morning. Good morning, church. Each Sunday during Lent, we've posed a question for you to engage, to help you think about your faith. Most of the questions have been oriented around the things that are holding us back from God or holding us captive from a closer relationship with God. And of course, the whole Lenten season is connected to Passover, the fact that the ancient Israelites were held bondage in Egypt, that they were captive, and then liberated through miraculous, miraculous means, God's presence, in the same way that Easter is a miraculous release, granting us new life. So, on this, our last Sunday in Lent, we'd like you to 
fill out one of these slips, we'll, which will become part of this chain. And of course, next Sunday, we have a very a special event around that chain. We want you to be here to see that. But this week's invitation is to finish this sentence. God, give me the courage to. God, give me the courage to. And you will find slips at either end of your pew. God bless. I want to take a moment just to orient us. We are indeed on this Palm Sunday entering into the city of Jerusalem. The best way to orient us is to hear these familiar words, to be reminded of the story of this day. So I want you to listen to words from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields, Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed Blessed is the the one one who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord. Blessed Blessed is the the coming coming kingdom kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve.
Would you join me in our confession? Patient God, we love a parade. We are happy to see banners waving and hear people shouting their praises. It is easy for us to jump from this celebration to the festivities of Easter morning without regard for what takes place in between those moments. We ask for your forgiveness and guidance when we equate acts of humility with weakness, when we minimize your presence to a commodity rather than the source of strength and life, and when we find ourselves fitting spiritual activities into our schedule rather than faithfulness setting our agenda. Lead us through the hosannas into the suffering of this world, that your presence may be made known. Amen. Laying aside judgment, God offers us redemption. Setting aside anger, God embraces us with love. Letting go of grief, God pours living water upon us. God's steadfast love endures forever. This is good news. We are forgiven and renewed. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You guys can have a seat. Any other children out there who would like to come forward and join me are more than welcome to do that now. Grab a seat on the steps. I have a few things I want to get. I have to set my palm down. Come on up. And my bulletin. All right. How are you? Thanks for joining in our Palm Sunday procession. And we all have palms to wave, right? Well, I have a special pin I need to put on that I found when I was cleaning a while ago. Who can read what my pin says? Ask me. I'm happy to help. It says, ask me. I am happy to help. I don't know if I'm going to regret wearing this. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many of you have ever been a helper or would consider yourselves to be a helper? I bet you have. I bet you have. I bet every single person has been a helper. Maybe you've helped your mom and dad. Maybe you've helped a teacher at school. Maybe you've helped a friend at school or grandma or grandpa. I bet you've even helped me or Andrew or Reverend Dale or another member of um, the church, you guys were a big help today, right, in singing and walking in and setting the Palm Sunday mood. It was wonderful. Well, I was thinking a lot about helpers today when I read our scripture passage that tells the story of Palm Sunday, which is Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem. Now, imagine the busiest, most crowded parade you've ever been to. Maybe like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. All those people yelling around. There's excitement. It's fun. It's joyful. But there are people that helped Jesus do what Jesus came to do that day, which was to bring peace to bring peace and good news. Jesus came riding on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. Now there's a couple of helpers that really caught my eye and that I wanted to lift up. First of all, there's the people that went to go ask for the donkey. They helped Jesus, right? Jesus was like, I need a way into the city. I need, I need to get people's attention. And rather than coming in on a big, giant white horse or, um, I don't know, another sort of powerful thing, Jesus chose to come in on a donkey. I bet his feet were almost dragging on the ground because it was a symbol of peace, and that's what Jesus came in to do. So there's the person who asked for the donkey. There's the person who let Jesus use their donkey, can you imagine if someone knocked on your door and said, hey, I really need to borrow your cat. I'll bring it back, I promise. I need to borrow your dog. I'll bring it back, I promise. Or I need to borrow something that was really important to you. I, I'll bring it back. It's for Jesus. It's for the Lord. The person in the, in the Bible said, if anybody asks any questions, just tell them the Lord needs it. So they let them use their donkey. So there's the person who asked for the donkey. There's the person who gave their donkey. Then there's the people in the crowd. Now, I remembered just a little bit yesterday that sometimes there might be puddles on the ground. 
So these people were throwing their cloaks and their jackets. They were throwing palm branches, leaves onto the ground to pave a way for Jesus to walk. So there's the people in the crowd throwing what they have down on the ground so he can walk in on his donkey. And then, who else is a helper in that story? Well, there's people shouting. There's people shouting, and there's people waving palms, and there's people excited and welcoming Jesus into their town. There's all sorts of helpers that day. And guess what? We are in that story too, and Jesus asks us, to be helpers. Jesus asks us to be helpers, to share his message of good news and peace. And now as we enter into the next week, it's going to get a little bit harder to be one of Jesus's helpers because Jesus is going to experience some things that are a little bit scary and a little bit sad. But Jesus still asks us to stay by his side and to raise our hands and be Jesus' helpers. And then on Easter, we're going to have a whole other job to be helpers, to share the good news of Christ's resurrection and love. But for now, do you think that you could raise your hand and be, say, I am happy to help when Jesus asks you to welcome him into your life, into our church, into the city of Jerusalem, and as Jesus spreads good news of peace and love. Do you think you can be helpers? All right, well, I, I think this pin is one of a kind, so I don't have those to give you, but I do have a sticker. You want to put it on your hand? Now, this smiley sticker, it reminds me of my pin. That's going to be your sign that you are one of Jesus' helpers and that you are happy to help in whatever way you can, in whatever way God has gifted you to do, okay? So when you see that today, you'll remember that you are one of God's helpers in this story and in the whole story of Jesus' life, right? All right, let's pray together, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer, all right? Loving God, we are grateful for the beauty of this day. We are grateful for the story of you entering into Jerusalem. And what a reminder it is of how many people helped to make that happen, how many helpers there were along the way, so that you could enter into that city and be welcomed with joy and with peace. God, we know that we too are your helpers, not only on this day, but also in our life as people of faith, as followers of you. So help us, God. Give us what we need to be helpers, to raise our hands and to say, ask me, God, I am happy to help. All of these things we pray in the name of Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much. You can head back to your seats. Thank you. 
now I'm ready. <laughs> that was very inspiring. Oh my. It's a good thing it stopped raining yesterday. I thought I might be preaching on Noah's Ark. <laughs> I want to share a story about a doctor this morning. Um, her name is Danielle Offrey, and she um, she said that it was sort of like looking in a mirror. We were the same height and build, same age, mid-30s, and both of us had two young children at home. We could have easily shared clothing, but today it was Dr. Offrey who was wearing a white lab coat And this other person was receiving a death sentence. She was dying, except the patient didn't know it yet. And Danielle Offrey says that she could not bring herself to share the fate of this inevitable death that awaited her patient whose name was Julia. There was nothing that could be done for Julia. She needed a heart transplant, but she was an undocumented immigrant. And so a transplant would have been impossible. Dr. Offrey was reflecting on this and realized that she just couldn't bring herself to share this news with a woman who had two young children. A woman who would become motherless in a short while. I think health care, for all the complaints we may have about it, is a pretty tough job. You know, in those moments when our bodies are shouting out for desperately needed attention and we have these fears that well up in us like a tsunami, we look to these doctors and our healthcare workers to provide a way to save us. And we sense those deep feelings of uncertainty and fear, helplessness. And we place our lives, literally place our lives, in the hands of healthcare professionals. About 20 years ago, um, there was an article in the Journal of Health Affairs that hosted an article titled, Physicians Are Not Always Open or Honest with Patients. Now, Dr. Offrey was mentioning this article and says that it's not that doctors try to be dishonest. They, they often frame a diagnosis in a more positive light than is warranted. That makes a lot of sense. Dr. Offrey, who's a clinical professor of medicine at NYU, New York University, says it can be very difficult to walk this razor's edge between being hopeful and yet honest and realistic.
healthcare workers have to be clinical and analytical, absolutely. And at the same time, they have to be empathic, compassionate, and they have to be in touch with their own feelings. Now, I'm reminded that this difficulty sometimes in telling the truth just it happens in more arenas than just healthcare. It it happens all the time in our lives. Sometimes we have to share a very hard truth with someone and it's really hard to do it well. In fact, I I was reflecting on this. I'm going to have to have a conversation with a dear friend of mine soon about something that really matters. It's not any one of you. (laughs) But it's a friend that I care deeply about and needs to hear some feedback. And I know I'm going to have to be very, very careful about walking that razor's edge. Dr. Afri reflected on this situation of telling the truth, and she said she thinks that she over-identified with her patient and that her emotions got the best of her. It doesn't mean that doctors are cowards, but all of us, I mean, we have to be honest here, all of us, by nature, prefer to avoid horrible truths. And denial may be one of our most powerful coping skills. For doctors, the challenge is to find a way to tell the truth. For patients, the challenge is to find a way to hear that truth. For most of my life, I've loved Palm Sunday. And I still do. And yet I've wrestled with this story of Jesus riding this humble donkey into what is clearly a dangerous zone. And I want to say to Jesus, don't do it. Don't go in there. No, no, work around it. (laughs) Do a work around. But for Jesus, his journey into the heart of Jerusalem represented his call to faithfulness. It was a call to tell the truth. In this case, telling the truth to power. Like a doctor needing to tell the truth to a patient who may think they have no need for a doctor, Jesus wanted to share a message with the religious community. I think his message goes something like this. You who are in the religious community, all of us, all of you, there's way, way too much focus on self-image. Way too much focus on self-righteousness. and way too little focus on serving the struggling people 
who are living in your midst. That message did not go over very well. Because it threatened a whole system, a whole institution. It threatened a culture. It threatened the way we do things. Now, many of the Jews who were living in and around Jerusalem were itching, itching, itching to get out from underneath of Roman control. You see, Rome basically owned the empire. And if you got out of line, there were consequences. And so what Jews wanted was a hero. They wanted someone to save them from this feeling of humiliation and oppression. These Jews wanted someone to give them their own kingdom, their own territory. They wanted someone to fix it, to make it better, like a doctor. And so when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this very humble of beasts, he was already speaking a different kind of truth by modeling his life as a person of peace, not as a warrior. The community, however, thought the cure, the answer, was installing a religious king, a warrior, a tough guy. Jesus was not talking about overthrowing the Roman Empire, though everyone around him, I think, wanted that to happen. No, he was talking about a different kind of kingdom, a different kind of community. Jesus was oriented around building capacity in people like you and me, building capacity building compassion. Why? What for? To take care of the vulnerable. To take care of the voiceless, the disadvantaged. Very clear. Jesus was talking about a beloved empire. Of course, that requires everyone to participate in the project, the pilot project. Because think about it, this is a pilot project that Jesus has started. A pilot project that calls us to grow in love, in gratitude, in service to neighbor. And it also, this project also includes Learning to tell the truth as well as listening to the truth with love. Growing deep in God is learning how to deal with truth. Telling the truth to one another in ways that reflect integrity. Our integrity. And at the same time, preserving the dignity of someone else. And I think there's a way to do that. It's hard. It's hard for the person telling the truth. And it's hard for the person receiving the truth. How many of you have tried to tell the truth to someone and you realize that the person you were sharing it with was not buying it? They didn't want to <laughs> they didn't want to hear it. Anybody here ever have that happen? Thank you for the hand. Yeah. Phew. 
Sometimes you can just see it. You, you can just, you know that it's not registering. And at the same time, let's, let's confess that it's difficult to hear the truth. Because everything inside of us wants to go on defense right away. We want to save face. We want to be right. I'm pretty sure that when Jesus headed in to Jerusalem on that donkey, despite the fact that there were all these cloaks, all this fanfare, all this celebration, all these waving of palms, I'm sure that Jesus suspected that he was going to go and get into trouble. And the more that he stayed in Jerusalem, the more ominous things looked. But what I think Jesus does, and I think this is very important in a day and age when faithfulness and integrity don't seem to matter much, I think Jesus modeled those very things. The word integrity, if you think about it, is the word integrated. Something that has an integration is whole and solid and dependable. And there's something that we as a religious people need to pay attention to in ourselves, in our in our quest for growing integrity. And we should be proud of that. Those of us who are members of the Jesus School. Jesus did not go to Jerusalem to become a martyr. It was not a death wish. We know that. Because when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is bargaining with God, do I have to do this? Do I really have to do this? No, he goes to Jerusalem to do one thing, tell the truth. You see, what religious authorities and institutions are prone to do and no religious organization or entity is exempt from this. What they try to do is diminish the scope of God. Let's put a nice little leash on God. Let's have God fit us. When God is so much more vast and encompassing, Well, I want to tell you about Julia, Dr. Offrey's patient. She finally found the courage and the wherewithal to, to tell Julia that she was going to soon die. And as Dr. Offrey writes, and I quote here, the actual moment, as expected, was horrible. <laughs> And the doctors were there surrounding Julia and they started crying and weeping and soothing and comforting Julia. And Julia was there essentially nodding, slowly piecing it all together. But the gift in that the gift in that was now Julia could spend the rest of her energy preparing her family. And so it became a gift. This coming week, we're reminded that the journey of Jesus will will be taken to the cross. The 
cross is simply a Roman form of capital punishment. We have electric chairs and lethal injections. Rome had crosses. No difference. The cross was a little more visible because everyone in the community got a heads up. Don't cross Rome. The important work for us as Christians is to continue to reflect upon the ways in which we avoid the truths that God is offering to us. Both in sharing and receiving it. And this is why the disciples are always frustrating Jesus. (laughs) He's trying to tell them the truth. And they're not having it. (laughs) And then when the truth becomes very apparent, they run. They run as far as they can go. May God help us. May God help us to hear, but more importantly, during this upcoming week, May God help us to hear, but more importantly, listen. Amen. Please be seated. As we move into our time of prayer this morning, 
I want to lift up some joys and concerns that have been shared with us throughout the week and listed in our book. A few joys, we've got two birthdays. Gwen Rivet is celebrating her 10th birthday and Sandy Brown is celebrating a birthday on March 26th. So uh, happy birthday to Gwen and to Sandy. A few concerns to lift up. We want to lift in our prayers Merv and Carol Nolt. Merv is the brother-in-law, and then Carol is the sister of Susan Fitzpatrick. Merv is currently in the care of hospice, and so we want to pray for him and for Carol and for all their family who surrounds them. We also want to keep in our prayers Bob Kraus, who is the father of Sarah Hogan. He is in the hospital, so we want prayers for healing and for patients um, as their family navigates this hospitalization. And Cliff Knipe has asked for prayers for Vicki and Al. Vicki and Al were former members of St. John's before their move to Florida a few years ago. Um, Al has uh, been recently diagnosed with cancer, so we want to keep um, them in our prayers, and we thank Cliff for bringing that to our attention. No doubt we all come to a time of prayer with many joys and concerns of our own on our hearts and minds, so I want to invite you to bring those to mind now as we lift them up to God together in prayer. Loving God, we come to you today mindful of the events of Palm Sunday, the story of Jesus that includes such a grand and triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, but then so quickly becomes a walk toward death on the cross. We remember that this wonderful parade of welcome for your son becomes another kind of parade before officials and the booing crowds. And instead of songs of praise, there are shouts to crucify him. And yet we know that it is because of his choosing to enter Jerusalem, telling the truth, taking the path he knew he was taking, that there is hope, grace, and love for all people in our world. God, there are still so many in need of hope in our world, so many in need of grace, so many in need of love. We pray for individuals and the parts in each of us that are suffering, struggling, hoping, waiting, dreading, grieving, doubting, and the individuals and the parts in each of us that are rejoicing, celebrating, exhaling. God, we take a moment now to lift up the joys and concerns among us. We celebrate with Gwen and Sandy as we give thanks for their lives and the ways they have impacted those around them. And God, we ask for your prayers of healing and love to surround Merv and Carol, Bob, Al and Vicki, and all who know and love and care for them. And we take a moment now, O oh God, to lift up the prayers of our hearts, knowing that even in the silence, you do indeed hear our prayers. God, you are a savior who enters in and heals from the inside out. As we honor your son Jesus entering into Jerusalem, we pray that you might enter into all that it means to be fully human. We ask that you enter into our lives, into our church, into our community, into our country, into our world. Heal us, God, from the inside out. Transform us, renew us, save us. Draw us closer to you in this journey of Holy Week. Empower us with strength and courage and with the same assurance you are with us, world without end. Amen.
As we move into our time of offering, we now have an opportunity to give. So I want to invite uh, you to go ahead and do that. You can also um, offer in, your, in the plate the gray slips of paper that you might have taken a moment to fill out. If you haven't gotten a chance to do that yet, you can always bring them forward after the service. But bearing all of this in mind, let us receive this morning's offering. Loving God, we give you thanks for each and every gift that has been shared. We give you thanks for the hands and the hearts that shared it. Bless all those who give gifts of so many kinds in so many ways. God, bless us as we use these gifts in ways that honor you, that honor our community, that honor your call for us in this world. All of these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. In just a moment, we will begin our transition into Holy Week. I remind you that you may stay seated during verse one and two of our closing hymn, and you can look to the choir 
at verse 3 to stand. So let us now begin our journey into Holy Week. When I am insulted and ridiculed, when my friends betray me, when I am falsely accused, let the same mind be in me that was in Christ Jesus. When I am denied by others, when I'm about to face a trial, when I am being judged unjustly, let the same mind be in me that was in Christ Jesus. When I explain myself and am misunderstood, when I meet others who are suffering even as I suffer. Let the same mind be in me that was in Christ Jesus. When I am about to be vilified, when I am pressured to act in ways that are against my values, let the same mind be in me that was in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Well, we'd like you to stay for fellowship following our worship time, which is downstairs in the assembly hall. Secondly, there are palms everywhere. So if you would like to decorate your house with palms, knock yourself out. <laughs> and may this Holy Week be one of depth and reflection and certainly love. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace today, tomorrow, forever. Amen.